does anybody, and Connie talked about leveraging our sufferings, and she said, we've all been given something, right? Why? It's unto our overcoming, right? Because that's how we receive that eternal weight of glory that's worked in us. That's one of the ways that we leverage in, in the heavenly realm. So think about those things in your life that you haven't yet overcome. There's probably one or two that stand out to you or maybe something that the Father has promised you that has not yet manifested. Okay, we probably all got those two. Maybe a negative cycle in your life that needs to be broken. Right about the time that the Lord was teaching me about this, I started noticing every spring I had this certain thing happen. It was like I would go somewhere like to minister or to teach or lead worship or whatever, and I would get publicly dishonored. And it was in really weird, bizarre, like misunderstood, crazy stuff. And, you know, it wasn't like I was devastated or anything like that, but it was bizarre enough that I started going, what in the world? And I noticed it happened in my life three Aprils in a row. And I was like, that is so weird. And so the Lord started teaching me about this. That was a cycle, right? And you're going to understand why that thing manifested in the spring because that's a key too. Now we are outside of time. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we're not subject to time, but time is a tool that we use. The father uses time. Remember how he told me, oh, I just use it to keep stuff organized in the earth realm. So there's a rhythm within the framework of time that if we understand and we can utilize it, we can use it to our benefit. Think of it like, right, we know, we all know about the law of gravity, right? If you, you know, if you open that door and don't use the stairs and jump over the railing, the law of gravity will take over and you'll hit the ground, right? And that is a law that God created. But there's a higher law. It's called the law of aerodynamics, which is why we don't, Planes don't fall out of the air. So the law of aerodynamics doesn't break the law of gravity. It supersedes it. So same thing here. We're not subject to time, but as kings and priests, as ones who are in Christ outside of time, this is a tool that we can use to advance the kingdom of God and to, to get the most bang for our buck in the spirit. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So think of those things that I mentioned, you know, Something you haven't overcome, something that hasn't manifested that the Father's promised, a repetitive negative cycle, a missed opportunity. Maybe you've made a wrong turn. And you're like, oh, I sure wish the Lord would redeem that. He can. He can redeem the time. I've shared this before. Some of you guys have heard me share about, and, and I believe this is part of how the Lord did that, that when I, I, grew, I got the baptism, I got saved when I was seven, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was nine, and then right after that, I started going to an independent fundamental Baptist church in school, and they didn't believe in all that, and I basically lost 20 years denying Holy Spirit. When I finally got back on the bandwagon, I was like, oh, I lost 20 years. Where would I be? I'd be so far, much further down the trail. You know, what if I'd gone to this other school, the one we made fun of because they were tongue talkers? What if I'd have done that? Right. And all these years, you know, that's kind of in your head, like what, where would I be? And um, <clears throat> when we renovated, remember when we renovated Dina's house, and we rented it out to the missionary couple from Go To Nations. Sean and I were meeting with them in our living room. And just small talk because we connected with them through a friend. And um, we're just, you know, where are you from? And they grew up in the same, same city that I did. They were from Baton Rouge. Well, where did you go to church? They went to that church, you know, the, the tongue talker ones. And uh, it, was, it was so strange but the Spirit of the Lord, right in the middle of that conversation, clear as a bell, the internal audible voice of the Lord said to me, all these years, you've been wondering where you would be and how mature and how much you'd know and all this stuff had you not made that wrong turn. He said, you'd be sitting right here, right now in this room, having this conversation with these people. That's how redemptive God is. In ways we cannot comprehend. So if you made a wrong turn or you want something, you wish something could be redeemed, I'm going to talk a little bit about rewriting your story because it's, it's the Father's delight to do this. So there is a season that God has woven into the fabric of earth time. Now, again, 
we're not subject to time, but we do live within the earth realm. We live and move and have our being in this realm. And as kings, we need to understand how, the, how it works, right? And he's woven this, this season into the fabric of earth time to give us a little bit of wind underneath our wings to overcome in all of those situations, all of those things that you said, yeah, I, I, could, I could use a do-over or I, I need to overcome this cycle. Well, this is, this is something that the Father, and again, it's not, you don't have to wait till this time of year, you know, if, if the day after Yom Kippur, the Lord reveals something, you don't have to wait a year, you can step back into it outside of time. But if we understand that several years ago, the father said to me, I, I want my mature, my maturing sons to understand how things work. Because when we understand how things work, we can use them for our benefit. So that's what this is about. This is not to be some limiting little box that we can only do now, but it's something for us to understand how that this works so we can maximize what the Father has given to us as a, as a real gift. So uh, Genesis 1.14, we all know it. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be signs and tokens of God's provident care. Don't you love that? And to mark seasons, days, and years. So the word translated seasons in that passage, you've probably heard this word is the Hebrew, Hebrew word moed which literally means appointed times. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's the same word that describes the feast, all the feasts in the Bible, same exact word, moed. So like Connie said, it's an appointed time. So the sun, moon, and stars, planets, constellations were assigned the job of governing our appointed times. Mankind was given dominion over creation, which includes time, right? It's because it's a created thing. Adam forfeited that, but Christ gave it back to us. And we literally, ooh, we literally have dominion over this thing called time, which is just a currency that the sons of God get to steward for his glory. And the first step in doing that and exercising that dominion is to be remember the sons of Issachar, that God praised them. And the Bible says they, they, knew, they understood the times and the seasons. So the first step in exercising dominion over this thing called time is to be like them and to understand how it works. So a couple of years ago when the father was really just uh, kind of teaching me about this, I had this supernatural encounter and the Lord sent me into the galaxies and he said, go decree divine order and justice into the stars. And I was like, I had this series of encounters that all had to do with the stars and stuff, and I didn't really have a grid for it then, but I'm just writing it in my journal as quick as I can. And he connected some dots later and is still connecting. There's a, I'm sure there's infinitely more to this. But what I saw just blew my mind because the stars were like, you know how in, an, in a spiritual encounter you just sense stuff. And I, I just knew that the stars were rejoicing. They were singing because they were, because, because I was there, I was bringing them into alignment and they were so happy to be coming into alignment with the will of the Father. And they were praising the Lord and just praising his wisdom and his kindness and his majesty. And I could literally feel how much they yearned to please him and they wanted to submit to him and they wanted to fulfill his will. And I, it just sounds funny to see, to think that I, I could see them smiling and dancing. And I wrote down in my journal, I'm going to read it verbatim what they said to me because it was just... You know, I was getting this by dictation. I couldn't have made this up. They said, our job is to govern the times and the seasons and to display God's glory. Our delight is to be in perfect alignment with his will and to release his perfect timing. Mankind was given dominion over creation, including us. Therefore, we became subject to futility at the fall. Remember, Romans talks about that. As you rise and take your place, bringing us back into alignment we will be the vehicle of his will manifesting upon the earth, right? So because they govern times and seasons, the fall thrust them out of alignment and they don't like it. And the occult, right? They understand how to exploit this to accomplish certain things. We're not going to go on that rabbit trail, but that would be a fun one one day. But as the sons, as we rise up and take our place and we spread our wings out over creation, we're bringing them back into alignment so that they can govern the times and seasons the way the Father wants them to. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? 
So they said, as you rise and take your place, bringing us back into alignment, we will be the vehicle of his will manifesting upon the earth. And this, this was crazy because all of these phrase, phrases were found in scripture. Connie, go ahead. Just to throw this out there, she's talking about us being a constellation. Do you, do you hear that? <laughs> We are the lights that sit in the heavens. That is what a constellation is. And so everything she's talking about deals with that. And so um, it's, it's really interesting because they're the stars, can, we, we govern time and that's, it's all of what she's talking about. And so uh, it, hopefully that helped connect a, a dot mm -hmm. there. Well, and that is in scripture. What's that verse in Daniel that says, those that, are, those that are wise shall shine as the firmament and those that lead many to righteousness as the stars. I forget, it's in Daniel, I forget the exact reference, but it is in scripture. It's your cosmic body. Yeah. And it's interesting, those who are wise, right? Who's been sent to grow us to maturity? The seven spirits of God, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might knowledge, the fear of the Lord. So that's speaking of those that have been schooled by the spirit of wisdom. It's all in there when you have eyes to see. We thought back in the day, we thought that was uh, just saying God liked us if we won, you know, we were soul winners or whatever, but ooh, it's a whole lot more than that, isn't it? <laughs> so they said to me, we're responsible to steward due time, perfect time, the fullness of time, and the time of life. Those are all found in different places in scripture. They said, we bow to the verdicts of the heavenly court, releasing the seasons of judgment, justice, grace, mercy, and peace upon the earth. We cooperate with the Jubilee season by redeeming the time according to the edicts of the Father. And it is our great delight to do this. All creation longs to be fully submitted to our holy and righteous King for his kindness and generosity have no end. And I came out of this encounter, I'm like, you know, just kind of like staring off into space because it's all in scripture, but so much more than what we thought. We were just, we will always be just scratching the surface. But really, you see this, uh, I think you really see this in Romans 8. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's us. That's talking about the mature sons. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Notice, I used to think that verse was talking about Adam, but it's him. It's capital him. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, right? Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So that's just a little scratch in the surface of why we're talking about, even though we're outside of time, why we're talking about something that's in to, inside of time, because it's a tool that we can use. So the sixth Hebrew month is named Elul, E-L-U-L. Now this word, you can't find this word in scripture because um, in the Bible, the months were, were only named. And the names of the month that, that we commonly know now came out of the Babylonian captivity. So Elul begins what's a Jewish tradition of 40 days of repentance in preparation for Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. So a lot of people, a lot of Bible scholars think there's a parallel there uh, between the 40 days. Remember when the children of Israel uh, spied out the land and they were there for 40 days and they come back, came back 10 with an evil report and Joshua and Caleb with, with the, the good report? And that's, you, you can find that in Numbers 13, because the word Elul literally means search. So we're searching out our promised land, which is what? It starts with our soul, right? We're spirits who have a soul. We live in a body, right? We've been given these things to steward. And so it's our time, with the Lord's help, of course, to search those things out. It's about evaluating and allowing God to show you what your promised land is and what resistance right? What giants you get to overcome in order to possess it. So that thing might be, you know, this, this rejection cycle, right? And you just think your life would be fine if everybody would stop rejecting you. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that because it starts in here. <laughs> Getting a little ahead of myself. So 
we, we start here and it works its way out. So every year God gives us these 40 days. And when he first taught me about that, he showed me it's almost like a, a it's like, almost like a transition, like a flex time in the realm of the spirit. And I noticed, I didn't notice it as much this year, but I used to notice it felt kind of loose. Like I couldn't find my flow. It just felt like everything was loosey goosey. And then he showed me that's by divine design because it's this flex time that kind of, allows that repositioning, that realigning, that catching up. Um, during this time, he, he pours out abundant grace to help us break free of negative cycles. So this year, Elul begins on sundown uh, this coming Wednesday on the 16th. And we'll, we'll, we'll usher it in with the love feast at Bob and Pamela's. And that's, that's why we do the love feast. Uh, we always do it on the new moon and it ushers in the, the new month. So, um, there you go, <laughs> to be official. So coming out of Egypt is like salvation. Wandering in circles in the wilderness is, is overcoming those repetitive cycles and strongholds, right? It's the process of growth and maturation, that basically. It doesn't mean, oh, you're something wrong with you because you have something to overcome. No, this is growing up in the spirit. And the promised land is, our promised land is when we think like a king rather than a slave. And it's when we have the ability to steward those promises and the tangible, physical manifestation of what he's promised. If God's promised you something and it hasn't manifested yet, there's some work that he's wanting to do with you so that you can be a good steward. Recurring cycles are a manifestation of the law of resonant frequency, which is this. We don't get what we want. We get what we resonate. Basically, we draw to ourselves the strongholds in our soul for the good or for the negative, right? What's a stronghold? If you're in, if you're in a war and the enemy is chasing you and you run into the stronghold, a stronghold is a good thing. We typically in church talk about it as being negative, and it can be, but you know what? It's like getting to base when you're playing tag or something, laser tag, you get to base. Well, a stronghold is, is you know, can be good or, or evil. The stronghold is a strong hold, right? They hold us in a cycle. We could have a positive stronghold in, the, in our life, maybe with finances, We've just always been blessed. And so we, there's not fear there. Maybe we're good, we're wise stewards of our finances. Maybe we're spirit led and we're generous. That's a stronghold. It keeps that cycle of abundance going in our life. But we know there's negative ones too. So it's the structure that gives either the Lord or the enemy legal ground, the Father to bless us and the enemy to devour us, right? And it's the place of agreement that allows demonic oppression when it's for the negative. The Greek word for stronghold, if you take it literally, it means a fortress. And so that, you know, that's where we find 2 Corinthians 10. We all know this scripture. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. This is talking about the negative ones. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the goal of this season is to allow the Father to search, right? We walk with Him in the field. I'll talk about that in a minute. Together, we search and we spy out our promised land. We, we say, oh, there's a giant. Oh, we're well able to overtake. We're well able to overcome this. Look what an amazing land this is. Thank you, Father. You know, we can say things like that during this season. And we can co-labor with him to break down negative strongholds and to establish godly strongholds. You know, it's a, you, a, and a, another example of a godly stronghold would be when somebody offends you to be quick to forgive. Right? That's a godly stronghold. It's a fortress that keeps you from being devoured by bitterness and resentment. And when it becomes a habit, as soon as that potential offense happens, Father, I forgive them, I bless them. It's a stronghold. It keeps a positive cycle going in our life. So the process of tearing down the demonic strongholds is basically maturing. It's being changed from glory to glory and being transformed by, transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, you know, we've talked about this between all, you know, Connie and I and Roderick, we've talked about this stuff a lot. So I'm not going to spend very much time on this at all, but just to cover our bases here, 
A, a stronghold would be what's in our DNA, our generational memory, right? This law was created for blessing, to pass down good from generation to generation, but it also can be used negatively. And so what Roderick has been sharing, right, the last few months is we're of a new bloodline, right? We're not of the bloodline of Adam, but when God shines through me, He's like light through a prism, right? I have certain generational inheritances that he, did, that he gave me on purpose, that he wants to shine for him, right? So we don't lose that, but we just bring everything into alignment with the, with the Lord. And, you know, I, most of you guys know I, I met my birth family in 2007. And so, the, you know, they, they live in another state. And so when I'm around them, it's, it's just fascinating to me how much I'm like these people that I never met my whole life. There's something to this, right? And it, again, it's it's both positive and negative. So we get to spy it out. And if there's a if there's a negative cycle that we've we've um, been handed in the bloodline, then we our process is identifying that and appropriating on purpose the work of the cross and saying, I got a new dad, I got a new DNA now. I don't have to live up under that. The second thing would be life experiences, either positive or negative. Third, what we think, right? Our belief system as, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? This also includes those deeper layers, subconscious, unconscious, not, not our religious correct answers. Oh, go on that rabbit trail. What we feel, even emotions that have been repressed or shut down, even if you're in denial, your emotions are still resonating and they're creating something. Emotions resonate strongly from any place that there's been a hurt or a trauma, and emotional thoughts are way more powerful than rational ones. How we see ourselves, it's generally a result of life experiences, you know, how our parents saw us, what they said, how they taught us to see ourselves, what was modeled for us, and uh, six, habits and patterns. A lot of times these things are survival mechanisms, right? The habits and patterns may have been the only way we knew to survive a particular situation, and sometimes, have you ever experienced this, you know, like at, at a certain place in your maturation? God's grace just covered that survival mechanism, even though it wasn't as best for you. But when you grew to a certain point, he was like, mm, my grace does not cover this anymore. You've got to grow up and you've got to deal with this now. I think we've all experienced that. So, you know, because at, at that place, his grace doesn't cover it. It hinders our destiny. We have to let them go. Where there is fruit, there is a root. That's just the way it works. God knows that we're going to sin. He knows that we're going to miss the mark. Everything about his interaction with us is redemptive. Everything. Everything. And, you know, the lamb slain from before the foundation. So he's also built a redemptive rhythm in his created world, into the seasons, into the feast. Think about it. You know, in this realm, there's spring, summer, winter, fall. There's a time that you plant things. There's a time that you harvest things, isn't there? And a good farmer knows how to utilize that rhythm that God established to get the most fruit. It's the same thing. So the, in Hebrew, the letters Elul, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, and Lamed, are an acronym for the phrase, Ani, Lidodi, Vidodi, Li, which means, I'm my beloved's and my beloved is mine. No, I love that. I love that. That just, okay, I'm done. Just right, that right there. So in Hebrew tradition, like what Connie said, it's a time, they say it's the king is not in the palace. He's in the field. He's walking with us, easily accessible. Now we know that the veil has been torn. We know we're one with him, right? You can't get any closer than that. And so we, we're not we're not saying, oh, he's here and he's not here the, the rest of the time. It's not that legalistic thing. Again, this is just a rhythm that he's created in this realm. So we know because of Christ, we can approach the throne boldly anytime. We know we're one spirit with him. But the point is this. During the season, God is especially near and he speaks to us about what, what needs to be redeemed from past cycles and seasons. I would say as you guys are really pressing into that, you know, whatever Holy Spirit shows you, he's the one that, that will guide you into all truth, of course. But really pay attention to those things that tend to be repetitive. Um, I usually set aside time 
to just um, spend extra time with the Lord, to listen, to pray, to get up earlier, to carve out time. The Lord's been really saying to me, get your house in order so that you can have more time during these 40 days. And um, I didn't press into it a lot last year because I was just, it was a lot going on. And I feel an urgency, not not scary urgency, like excited urgency to really, really press into it with all my heart this year. And so, you know, I press into uh, pray. I pray through things I'm struggling with. I also read through my journals. I'm a big journaler. So I take out my journals from past years. And if something stands out to me for now, then I'll just keep a little word document of stuff like, okay, remember this. And I do the same. I write down dreams. So I go back and I go through my journals and my dream journals and prophetic words, prophetic words I've been given. And, you know, don't get bogged down in this. Again, it's Holy Spirit. You don't have to remember everything or do everything. But just as you're reading, if you, if you choose to do this, as you're reading through your journals and your dreams and your prophetic words, if Holy Spirit puts his finger on something and says, oh, this is a key for you right now, then just, just make a note. And then through the rest of the, the rest of the days, you can continue just saying yes to that because that's what he's looking for, right? He's just looking for our agreement. He's looking for our yes or our no, depending on what the case may be. Father, I see this cycle. I see this in my bloodline. I'm saying no to it. I'm saying yes, that I'm a new creation. I'm saying yes to the opposite of that or whatever. You know, he, he leads us, he guides us. And, um, after I did this the first two years, I can't remember now what years were the, when he first taught me this, but I remember after I had really pressed into this for two years, I look back and everything that he had highlighted those first two years had been uprooted. And I kind of look back on that third year. I was like, whoa, kind of like this works, you know, like you're surprised, but um, you know, it, it really does. It's, it's added grace, which I love. So the first day, okay, so we have the, the month of Elul, which is 30 days started because the Hebrew day starts in the evening, right? Not the morning. So the first day would be Wednesday, right? Wednesday into Thursday, September, uh, August 16th. So that's 30 days. The first day of the following month, which is the month Tishri, is Yom Teruah. Does anybody know what Yom Teruah is? Feast, Feast of Trumpets, right? And a... And so that would begin, so you got, the, you got the month, right? And so that begins on sundown on Friday, September 15th. I had to have Sean help me with the dates because we, if you notice, if you're looking at a regular Hebraic calendar, we're a couple of days off and I was getting all confused. I'm not going to get into this tonight because it's a way rabbit trail, but the Lord showed, really it was more Sean. We prayed into it together, but this was the revelation the Lord gave him how, um, how we calculate the um, Hebraic months when the when the sun the earth and the <laughs> when the moon conjunction what the earth and the moon the earth and the moon are in conjunction so you don't see a moon a lot of times if you've really been into the Hebraic stuff they'll go out and they'll look, they'll look for the crescent moon and they say oh that's when the new month starts but the Lord showed Sean that life begins in the dark, doesn't it? Right? We don't lay eyes on you for nine months, but you're there. So it's the same principle, evening and morning were the first day, the Bible says. So we we calculate it. If you want to learn more about this, because I'm going to, I'm not going to get bogged down in this. If you go on allthingsrestored.org and you go to our blog, every year I post the love feast for every month and this explanation of how we do this. It's not a legalistic thing. I don't think the Lord's going to be like, you're a day off. I'm sorry. I'm not walking in the field with you. It's not like that. <laughs> you know, it's not a legalistic thing here, but that just explains why we, why we calculate it. And it, it'll be like one or two days off from the Hebraic calendar. So just be led, ask Holy Spirit, do what he tells you to do. So, but anyway, the Feast of Trumpets, Sham Teruah is like a prophetic wake up call. And it also represents, you know, when the, when the king comes out and they're, you know, they blow the trump, doo -doo -doo, and the king comes out, kind of both of those things. Because what we're doing is we're choosing to make him king over our lives, over all the stuff that he showed us during a rule. We're choosing to say yes to the things that he's revealed to us. That are, that are his will, we're saying no to those things that he desires to help us break. So we're, we're putting him king as king and king and lord of lords over those areas. And um, so it is kind of like what, you know, when um, 
Joshua and Caleb had spied out the land, they came back and they trumpeted their report. Oh, I think I did that twice. Yeah. And they trumpeted their report, right? So we can we can be like Caleb, let us go up at once and take possession for we're, we're well, well able to overcome it. Or we can be like the 10 spies. Oh, if we'd only died in the Egypt and all that. We, we don't, we don't want to be those guys. So after the 10 days, so um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, this year will start on Sunday, September 24th. Those 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, are called the 10 Days of Awe. And there's a lot to say about this that I, that I won't get into tonight, but just in context of this little teaching of what we're talking about with Elul, I just want to mention that I believe at Yom Kippur, we're sealed for another cycle. And it kind of ties in with what Connie was talking about, about the suffering working for us in eternal weight of glory. Whenever something, whenever something comes back around, right, whenever, whenever that promise is not manifest, when it does come back around, it's huge. You look in Scripture, one good, uh, two good examples are whenever in Scripture, if people awaited like, you know, Abraham and Sarah, Zacharias and Elizabeth waited all these years for the manifest of their promised child, and, you know, Hannah was Samuel, right? Whenever that thing manifested, it was huge. That's a spiritual principle, and I believe it's what Connie was talking about, how our sufferings work for us in eternal weight of glory, right? So I believe that that, that should just encourage you that if you've had to wait for something, it's going to be big when it arrives. And so the cool thing about Yom Kippur, go ahead. That's the interest part of the economic system of heaven. Every oh, time wow. it circles, it gains interest and momentum. And that's what perseverance means, weight. All of that is part of the economic system. So it's never, it's, it's, if we just have to learn to see so that we can step into um, gaining the benefit of the heaven, heaven's ways. Oh, that's good, Connie. That's good. You hit that on the head. That's really good. So that's interest. So you're never without hope. So nobody in here is dead. So it's not too late. Right? You're never too dead for resurrection. Right? And you can on purpose draw upon that interest and that eternal weight of glory for anything that's been delayed, any, any, even stuff you might be saying, well, I did it to myself. I've, I've made a stupid wrong decision. Oh, the mercy of God, the mercy of God. He's so good. He knew you were going to do that when he was the lamb slain before anything ever showed up here. He already knew, and he's provided redemption and mercy and restoration and all of that. Look at Peter, right? He's a, he's a good example of that. So we're sealed for another cycle at, at Yom Kippur, at the Day of Atonement. And I believe we will eat from the fruit of those things that we've said yes to and those things that said no to. For me, now, I don't have scripture for this, so I still have this question before the Lord. Some of you guys might get revelation on it. I've noticed that I see tangible fruit a lot of times in the spring around Passover. So I think there is something there to it, but I, I, it's still a mystery. Maybe Mr. Sterion will help me with that. But I think that's when the harvest of those seeds, of those yeses and those noes, becomes tangible. So now we know there's no time in God. We know that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the feast. And in him, you know, we're not limited by time and by space. And through him, we have legal access to, you know, Father and to dimensions outside of time. We know all that. But yet we want to use the, the rhythm of this. Um, and, we, you know, we want to just use and let it propel us, propel us into his plans and purposes. So real quick, I'm almost done, but I want to talk a little bit about the was, the is, and the is to come. Now, Connie has been talking a little bit about this too. So we know the scripture, Revelation 1.8, I am the Aleph and the Tav, says the Lord God who is who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we see from the scripture, God is past, present, and future. He's everything. He encompasses all of existence. The was, the is, and the is to come are not only aspects of God, but they're actual realms and dimensions that in him we can step into and we can encounter. We can step into the is. We can step into the was. We can step into the is to come. Now, it's interesting. Have you ever wondered why the is comes first? 
seems like it'd be was, is, is to come. Because the is is the portal, right? The eternal present, that's the only starting place. That's the only door we have is right now where we are. Mm -hmm. That's the door. Jesus said, I am the door, didn't he? I am. So we step, and right after the Lord was teaching me this, I kept seeing... I kept seeing the, the face of Jesus and it, I kept getting sucked into his eyes and then I would end up in the dimensions and the galaxies and then I realized, oh, it's because he's the I am and I'm stepping through that portal. But once I go through that door, I'm outside of time and then I can travel the timeline. I can go redeem things in the past. I can rewrite my story. I can, I can go and pop out in the, the is to come, which is the Bible calls it you're expected and I can pull those things back. You know, we're not as small as we think. Ecclesiastes 3.15 talks about it. Whatever was is, whatever will be is, that's how it always is with God. So the is is our, is our door. So Exodus 3, you know, remember when um, Moses and the burning bush and, you know, then he, he told, God told him to go confront Pharaoh and, you know, I'm sure he was more than a little nervous. And then, you know, Moses was asking like, well, who do I, who do I tell him sent me? And, you know, what's your name? And this, I'm not going to try to pronounce this. So thankfully it is on the screen here. This is um, the Hebrew, a, a Hebraic Bible that uses the, the real real words, but it's basically, I am, will be what I am, will be. So that's the name that God revealed to Moses because I am is enough. You enter through me, but here's what will be. Here's your expected end, right? Go do this and here's what's going to happen. So that Hebrew word, E-H-Y-E-H, -E comes from the word haya, and, um, the letter He, right? The breath of God. It's the breath of God. Remember that changed Abram and Sarah into Abraham and Sarah, right? That breath. So we've got that. This word is connected, very strongly connected with the He, and except this time it's speaking of God's existence inside of time. He isn't in, he isn't limited by time, but he does exist within time. And so the two haze in the name that God revealed to Moses have to do with the I am opening the door to the I will be. So the is, the eternal present, is your portal to the realm of timelessness. The was, you rewrite your story. The is to come is your expected end or the manifestation of God's highest and best, that hundredfold, those promises, that stuff that's so mind-blowing, you can't even comprehend it yet. That's the key to that. So by stepping into the was, you can reframe your world and you can create a different outcome. And I mean, that that goes against our logic, but I have understood this when I read um, a book by Paul Yonggi Cho. And some of you guys have heard me tell this story before, but this illustrate, it illustrates this principle better than anything I've ever read in a practice to show what this principle looks like with skin on right? So we got the scriptures, right? We're understanding the concepts, but I think sometimes with me, I don't know, you guys might be this way. Sometimes the breakdown comes, well, what does that look like with skin on? Okay, that was an awesome teaching, and I understand we go through the was, but what, what do I do with that? How, what, how do I apply that? And so Paul Yonggi Cho tells of this a story of this man in his church in Korea that was hit by a car, a taxi, and was very seriously injured. And um, I guess at that time, if a taxi driver would hit you, they'd be responsible for your hospital bill. So the, the cab driver threw him in the back of the car and um, he drove around with him all day before somebody found the guy. I don't know how that happened, but he ended up in the hospital. By then he was like in really bad shape. He was in a coma and, um, you know, Dr. Sh Dr. Cho had heard about it and he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, just bring him to full consciousness for five minutes. And so while he was still praying, he, he was there at the hospital with him. He prayed that. And while he was still praying, the guy opened his eyes and started saying, Pastor Cho, I'm dying, I'm dying. And he goes, stop, stop saying that. And he knew that he'd been given the five minutes that he asked the father for. And so he corrected the man. He said, if you say you're dying, you're going to die. If you think you're dying, you're going to die. So stop that. And he said, use your imagination to picture yourself at before the accident happened, but with a different outcome. And the guy's kind of laying there like, okay. And so in his, he, he kind of led the guy through it. 
And he walked him through and said, okay, imagine yourself crossing the street safely. I think he was going to buy a present for his wife or something. And imagine yourself going to the store and buying her this and then going home and giving it to her and having dinner and enjoying a nice evening. And so, you know, peaceful and quiet and in vibrant health. And so, you know, the man used his imagination. It's a gate. The imagination is a door. It's a portal into a realm that we can accomplish more than we can doing all this earthly heavy labor, right? It's a door. Again, that can be used for good or for evil. It's a, it's a, it's a door. So the man, you know, let Dr. Cho kind of pray him through this and he, he used his imagination and all the nurses and the doctors in the room, they were like, they started laughing because it's like, you know, this, this pastor's cuckoo and they thought it was so funny. But then what happened is this, the room got supernaturally hot and the guy's bed started to shake and everybody was kind of, then everybody sort of freaked out and to everybody's amazement, the man walked out of the hospital in perfect health in just one week. So that gives us one little, I mean, it may look a little different, but does that give you an idea of what this principle can look like in your life with skin on? So again, oh Lord, I sure wish I had a do-over. Okay. Redeem. He can redeem in ways. You can't quantify it, right? We step in by simple childlike faith, but we do apply spiritual principles that we find in the word. So once you see cycles that need to be broken in your life, you can rewrite your story. And with your, with your sanctified imagination, you can create with the Father your expected end. So, you know, how many, how many have prophetic words that haven't manifested yet? Most, almost everybody in this room. So prophetic words reveal the Father's heart, but a lot of times, especially as we mature, He lets us co-create those things with Him. Remember how the, I, some of you got most of you guys have probably heard me share this story. The first time the Lord ever took me into the stars and he was like, arise, my love, my fair one, come away. And I'm like, oh, I'm ruined. You know, he grabbed me and he rearranged the stars. He's like, check this out. And then he did the second time. He's like, let's do this together. And then the third time he was like, you know what to do. Let me watch. So that, that illustrates our maturation process, right? And when we're babies or babies in an in a area, a lot of times he'll just, he'll just rush in and he'll do it for us while we stand in amazement. But as we mature or as we mature in that thing, he wants to do it with us, right? And then as we continue to mature and gain faith and have those victories under our belt, he finds such delight in us being mature sons. Now, we know we're not doing it apart from him. We're one with him. We can't, Right? Right. But we understand that we understand the maturation process and how this works. So the future emerges through the portal of the proactive imagination through your oneness with the is to come. You can manifest inside of time everything that God has promised you outside of time because they're already yes and amen there. Right. In his heart, everything that the father has destined for you that you know of, that you're having trouble getting to, that you've gotten prophetic words about, stuff you haven't even thought of yet. It's already done in his heart, outside of time. But you get to co-labor with him and bring it to pass inside of time. We all know this verse. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Right? That's So I'm almost done here. You guys okay? A couple, couple more minutes. Okay. I'm, try, I'm going through this as quick as I can. So uh, Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. So there's an appointed time for everything in the earth realm, but again, we've been given dominion there. So um, we talked about a little bit about Abraham and Sarah, right? It's interesting that God had him look at the stars. You know, Abraham was a Chaldean, or Abram at that time was a Chaldean. They understood stuff about the stars probably that we haven't even caught up with yet. And he promised him descendants, 13 years passed. And then this is what God came, he was Abraham, he changed his name. God came back and said, at the appointed time, you remember what that, what that phrase is? Way back at the beginning of the teaching, appointed time, Moed, the stars 
right? I will return to you according to the time of life. And interesting that that's one of the things when I was in the stars, that's remember the stars said we govern this and this and this. One of the things was the time of life. Isn't that interesting? And of course, God kept his promise. And, you know, we, we know the rest of the story. I'm going to give you two more examples of the stars and how, how they help us uh, to step into the things of the Lord. And I'm done. Um, remember when Joshua in uh, Joshua 10? With supernatural redemption of time, if you feel like, oh, I've lost time, I'm behind. Um, most of you guys know in 2015, the Lord says to me one day, I'm having my quiet time, he says to me, you're behind. And that's not what you want to hear at all. And uh, he said, you're behind schedule. And so uh, he said, I want you to go to summer school. So I did. I, you know, cleared my calendar as much as I could that summer. And I did, I, I just spent time with him from five to one every day. And it was like drinking from a fire hydrant. Why? Now see, and I'd like, oh, boy, I'd like that same fire hydrant every day. But it was like that because I had gotten behind and he was catching me up. Now, I'm not sure how many years or months or whatever I was behind. He didn't tell me that. But I do know he got me caught up in one summer. And he gave me the strategy, and all I had to do was say yes and be obedient. So he can redeem time. So with Joshua, he made the sun stand still, remember, for a whole day so that they could defeat their enemies. We, you know, we all know that story. And um, it was interesting how it says that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. So it's letting us know that God was honoring what Joshua was doing. It was like God was letting Joshua be a little bit more in the driver's seat here. And then, of course, we know in Judges 5, this is one of my favorites. And I noticed this right about the time the Lord was teaching me about this. I've probably read this passage a bazillion times and never seen it before. But remember in, uh, when Barak, you know, Josh, when uh, Deborah in Judges 5 went to battle with Barak against Sisera? And they won. You know, we all know J.L. put the tent peg through his head and all that. But, <laughs> but the cool thing, I love this, in the Song of Deborah, Afterwards, it says, from the heavens, the stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera. Now, remember that encounter? What the stars are, their responsibility in the scheme of things, and how they want us to, to spread our wings over them and bring them back into alignment. But what do, what do they do for us? They do the job that God has given them to do, right? And they fight for us according to the will of the Father. I mean, is this, is this mind-blowing? Isn't this cool? And remember, Caleb was as strong as at 85 as he was at 20, and that was, or 40 or whatever. Remember? Now, that's an application, again, supernatural redemption of time. It's all through Scripture, all through Scripture. So, um, as we submit to God, right, we're under authority, we're in authority. As we submit to him, this isn't just arbitrary. I want what I want. I'm going to, you know, stars, give me a Ferrari. That is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is we're in submission to the Lord. We're under authority and we're in authority, right? And so we're bringing, we're bringing the times and seasons. We're bringing creation into alignment with the Father's will so that things that were done or not done or whatever in past seasons can be redeemed and brought back into alignment. And with the beginning of, the, of those of of a new season, those things are sealed and solidified so they bring forth fruit in our life. So it's a redemptive cycle. If cycles aren't broken, they, they do become more deeply entrenched. And again, it's not that you can't access this anytime. The throne of grace, you can always run there. But let's utilize the momentum of the season, get a little extra on. So how many of you guys are familiar with the Fibonacci sequence? Okay, you ever seen this before? It's, some people call it the golden spiral. This is probably another thing. What, Connie, don't Google this? <laughs> probably This is probably another don't believe everything you Google with this. There's some good and some crazy. Um, but if you drew circular arcs connecting opposite corners of squares, that's how you create this thing. But basically, it's called the Fibonacci sequence, and it's found everywhere in creation. Uh, galaxies, you'll see pictures of galaxies that, that look like that, seashells, right? Living cells, 
everything, you know, we're created by the same creator. So the mathematical equation is one where each new number is the sum of the two previous ones. Now, math is not my strong point. We should probably get Sean or Bob if, if anybody needs to elaborate on this. But basically, the point of this in context of this teaching is the new is continuously created from the old. Nothing is disconnected. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is ever, ever lost. So the things that I'm, that I'm co-creating with God now is the sum of everything I've done, everything I failed to do, everything I've repented for, everything that he's redeemed, and even the time that has passed. Nothing is lost. Nothing is wasted. Each new day is nothing but an opportunity to create what exists only in the spirit realm out of what has up to this point existed in the natural realm, even in the form of missed opportunities. Be, be, be hopeful. I hope that you guys are leave here filled with hope and faith. And the, like we talked about, the interest, right? When that thing comes back around, the spiral just gets larger every time. Every time an opportunity is missed, when it cycles back around, it's bigger. There's no such thing as a total loss unless you quit, right? What does the Bible say? In due time, in due season, and that was another thing the star said to me, in due season you will reap if you... If you don't faint, right? So again, we know Jesus is the embodiment of all the feasts, the Jubilee and all that. Because remember Jubilee, everything was reset every 50 years. Land went back, your debts got erased, all that. We know Jesus is the embodiment of all that. We can access him anytime we want. But I do believe there's something really near to the heart of the Father in, in the feast and how he's created this. So I hope that you guys just were encouraged. I hope you're leaving full of hope and faith. And I hope that even while I've been talking, that the Father has given you strategies of how to carve out time to walk with the King in the field so that we are on go, right? And I, I love this. This pretty much sums it up. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied are the people who know the joyful sound, who understand and appreciate the spiritual blessings symbolized by the feast. They walk, O Lord, in the light and favor of your countenance.